of uh, Manuel Arjona, who is going to talk about, about the um, literary and epigraphic evidence on sanctuaries and rituals here in the near from, from Athens in ancient Phaleron. Please, Manuel, your turn. Mm -hmm. I will speak in, in Greek. Okay. Πολύ για την παρουσία σα. Επίση, ευχαριστώ του δύο οργανωτέ αυτή τη ημερίδα για την πρόσκληση, δηλαδή την Ισπανική Πρεσβεία, la Embajada Española. Καθώ και το Ινστιτούτο Θερβάντε, el Ινστιτούτο Θερβάντε, muchas gracias. Το οποίο μάλιστα μα φιλοξενεί σήμερα εδώ. Ακόμα ευχαριστώ την Διευθύντρια τη Εφορία Αρχαιοτήτων Πυραιό και Νήσων, την κυρία Χρυσουλάκη, καθώ και τι αρχαιολόγου κυρία Ψαρή, κυρία Ανδρέου, κυρία Γιαμαλίδη, κυρία Σκαρδαρέση και τον κύριο Σιρόπουλο, για την συζήτηση. Επίση ευχαριστώ και την συνάδελφο κυρία Τριτσαρόλη για τι χρήσιμε παρατηρήσει τη. Λοιπόν, όπω μπορείτε να δείτε από το τίτλο τη ομιλία, σήμερα θα αναφερθώ σε κάποια από τα ιερά που ιδρύθηκαν στο Αρχαίο Φάληρο, καθώ και σε συγκεκριμένε θρησκευτικέ τελετέ, οι οποίε διεξήχθηκαν στην εν λόγω περιοχή. Θα βασιστώ κυρίω σε πληροφορίε που αδρούμε από τι φιλολογικέ και τι επιγραφικέ μαρτυρίε ή πηγέ. Και το χρονολογικό πλαίσιο που θα εξετάσουμε εκτείνεται από τη γεωμετρική. <coughs> Προτού εντρυφήσουμε στην ανάλυση των γερών και των τελετών, είναι οπωσδήποτε απαραίτητο να ανημονεύσουμε ακόμα και συντομία μερικά ανατολικά του επανομασόμενου φαντικού όρμου, όπου μάλιστα εξέβαλε και ο ποταμό Κυφισό. Τα ακριβή υπόλοιπα όρια του αρχαίου Δήμου του Φαλίου δεν μα είναι γνωστά. Υποθέτουμε ωστόσο ότι αυτό συνόρευε στα βόρειο-δυτικά με το Δήμο Πειραιά και του Φαλιρικού Όρμου ω επίνη. Προηγήθηκε τη χρήση των λιμανιών του Πειραιά, καθώ το Φάληρο απήχε από το άστι των Αθηναίων μόλι 20 στάδια, περίπου 3,64 χιλιόμετρα, δηλαδή λιγότερο από ότι ο Πειραιά. Με την χρήση αυτού του λιμανίου, κατά τον 7ο αιώνα π.Χ., ενδέχεται να συσχετίσεται η άκρη σε άλλε περιοχέ του Σαρονικού, λόγω χάρη στην Αίγυνα, αλλά και πιο μακριά, αν υπολογίσουμε την παρουσία αμφορέων τύπου SOS σε πολύ απομακρυσμένε θέσει τη Μεσογείου. Πιθανώ το λιμάνι του Φαλίρου αγκυροβόλησαν επίση πλοία που έφεραν στην Αττική οψιανό από τι Κυκλάδε αλλά και αγκία από την Κόρυθο και την Ανατολική Ελλάδα, ευμήματα των οποίων βρέθηκαν μάλιστα σε πολλέ ανασκαφέ. Επιπροσθέτω, είναι πιθανό να αναχώρησαν από το Φάληρο διάφοροι αθηναϊκοί στόλοι, οι οποίοι σύμφωνα πάντα με την αρχαία γραμματεία. Έλαβα μέρο στι πολεμικέ συγκρούσει που ξέσπασαν κατά τον 7ο και τον 6ο αιώνα π.Χ. Πρέπει να έχουμε υπόψη ότι κατά τα αρχαϊκά χρόνια το Φάληρο υπήρξε και ιδιαίτερα ευάλωτη περιοχή από όπου η Αττική δείχνει ενδεικτικά ότι στο Φάληρο πραγματοποιήθηκε το 511 π.Χ. η αποβίβαση του στρατηδών. Το Φάλαιο επίση λαϊλατήθηκε από του Αιγίνιου περίπου το 506 π.Χ., ενώ απειλήθηκε για πρώτη φορά από περσικά πλοία το 490 π.Χ. Α σημειωθεί ακόμα ότι το 479 αναχώρησε κατά πάσα πιθανότητα από το Φάλαιο ένα μέρο του στόλου, το φαλαιρικό τείχο, μήκο 35 στα 2, το οποίο εκτινόταν από το άστι των Αθηναίων έω το Φάλαιο. Αυτό το σκέλο του αμυντικού συστήματο τη πόλη διατηρήθηκε σε καλή κατάσταση τουλάχιστον έω το, έως τουλάχιστον το 427 π.Χ., ενώ φαίνεται ότι κατά το τέλο του 5ου αιώνα π.Χ. ήταν πια σε αχρηστία. Ο Φαλίρου δεν μπορούσε να παρέχει πια τι απαραίτητε συνθήκε για τον ελιμενισμό, την προστασία και την επισκευή όλων των τριέρων, τριέρων του αθηναϊκού στόλου. Σε κάθε περίπτωση είναι σίγουρο ότι το λιμάνι του Φαλίρου συνέχισε να χρησιμοποιείται από εμπορικά σκάφη. Βέβαια, έχουμε πολλές μαρτυρίες και για την αλλιευτική δραστηριότητα στο φαλιρικό όρμο, ενώ το Φάληρο υπήρξε περιστατικά και χώρος εστρατολογήσεις ναυτών. Το Φάληρο ήταν μια Κατοικημένη περιοχή, παρόλο που μέρος 
του καταλαμβανόταν από Έλλη. Οι φιλολογικές και επιγραφικές πηγές αναφέρουν πολλά ονόματα δημοτών, από τα οποία ίσως το πιο γνωστό είναι εκείνο του φιλοσόφου και πολιτικού του 4ου αιώνα π.Χ. Δημήτριου του Φαλιρέα. Το Φάλιρο παρήγαγε και αγροτικά προϊόντα, όπως τα Σφαλιρικάς, που ήταν μια ποικιλία λάχανων. Επίσης, το Φάλιρο ήταν μια περιοχή συνάθρησης και διέλευσης. Έτσι, έχουμε πληροφορίες για το εμφρεατή δικαστήριο, που ενδεχομένω βρισκόταν στο Φάλιρο ή κοντά στην περιοχή της Ζέας. Η διαδρομή Φάλιρο-Αθήνα ήταν ιδιαίτερα αγαπητή στους φιλοσόφους. Τέλος, το Φάλιρο ήταν και χώρος ενταφιασμού, όπως ξέρετε, στο Δέλτα Φάλιρου ε, βρεθεί, έχει βρεθεί ένα νεκροταφείο, τεράστιο νεκροταφείο. Ήμουν ατυχερός να συμμετάσχω στις ανασκαφές. Ήταν και εξάσκησης υπασίας, επίσης. Πάμε. Τώρα. Σημαντικές λατρευτικές πομπές επίσης διέσχισαν το φάλιρο και μπαίνουμε πια στο κύριο θέμα που μας απασχολεί εδώ. Ο, φι... ο Φιλόχωρος, ο Πολυδεύκτης και ο Φώτιος αναφέρουν παραδείγματο χάρη μια πομπή των Αθηναίων κατά την οποία το ξώανο της θέας Παλάδας, δηλαδή της Αθηνάς Παλάδας, μεταφερόταν επί τη θάλασσα, δηλαδή στην παραλία. Αυτοί οι συγγραφείς μας πληροφορούν ότι οι νομοφύλακες είχαν το καθήκον να πέμπουν και να κοσμούν την πομπή, δηλαδή να την αποστέλουν, αλλά και να διευθετούν κάθε λεπτομέρεια ώστε η παρέλαση να διεξάγει με σωστό και αρμονικό τρόπο. Στην σχετική επιστημονική βιβλιογραφία, οι συγκεκριμένες φιλολογικές αναφορές συσχετίζονται με τρεις μεταγενέστερες επιγραφές, στις οποίες βλέπουμε αυτές οι, οι, οι επιγραφές ε, χρονολογούνται στο τελευταίο τέταρτο του δευτέρου αιώνα π.Χ. Λοιπόν, αυτές οι επιγραφές, σας δείχνω μόνο μία, μαρτυρούν ότι οι Αθηναίοι έφηβοι, μιλάμε πάντα για το θεσμό της εφηβείας, Έβγασαν μαζί την παλάδα, δηλαδή την εικόνα της, την συνόδευαν μέχρι το φάλιρο και τέλος την έβασαν πάλι πίσω στην αρχική της θέση. Η επιστροφή πιθανώς γινόταν το βράδυ, καθώς οι έφηβοι έπρεπε να κρατήσουν και δαυλούς. Η πομπή επιβαλλόταν να διεξαχθεί με τα πάσης ευκοσμίας, δηλαδή σωστά και ωραία. Στου οζόμενου εστίχου των επιγραφών δεν αναφέρονται οι νομοφύλακε, ωστόσο ο κοσμητή των εφήβων σίγουρα θα είχε την ευθύνη τη σωστή συμπεριφορά των νέων κατά την τέλεση τη πομπή. Σε μία από αυτέ τι επιγραφέ επισημάνεται ότι οι γεννητέ, που δεν ξέρουμε ακριβώ ποιοι ήταν, συνόδευαν του εφήβου. Λοιπόν, <coughs> κάποιοι ερευνητέ, όπω η Σορβίνο Ιγκουτ, Ισχυρίζονται ότι το ξώανο που μεταφερόταν στην θάλασσα ήταν το παναχαίο ξώανο της Αθηνάς Πολιάδας που φυλαζόταν στην Ακρόπολη των Αθηναίων. Σύμφωνα με αυτή την άποψη, η πομπή επί τη θάλασσα διεξαγόταν στο πλαίσιο των εορτών των πλυντηρίων. Θεωρείται δηλαδή ότι κατά το μήνα Θαρχιλίων, δηλαδή περίπου στα μέσα Ιουνίου, καλή εποχή, μέλη του γένους των πραξιεργηδών απογύμναναν το ξώανο της Αθηνάς Πολιάδος από το πέμπλο του. Εν συνέχεια, το ξώανο, το ξώανο τυλιγόταν σε κάποιο ύφασμα και οδηγούταν από την Ακρόπολη στο Φάλιρο, ενδεχομένως πάνω σε άρμα. Σύμφωνα πάντα με τη συγκεκριμένη άποψη, οι γεννητέ που αναφέρονται σε μία από τις εφηβικές επιγραφές θα ήταν εξίσου μέλη του γένους των πραξιεργίδων. Σημαντικό στάδιο της τελετσαλήρου, ίσως από τις λεγόμενες λουτρίδες. Τα πλυντήρια αποσκοπούσαν στο ετήσιο εξαγγισμό της εικόνας της θεάς και σηματοδοτούσαν την έναρξη μιας καινούρια περίοδου. Άλλοι ερευνητές, όπως ο Μπούρκαρ, 
θεωρούν ότι το ξόαλο που μεταφερόταν στο Φαλήρο ήταν το άγαλμα της Αθηνάς που βρισκόταν στο Παλάδιο. Η ερμηνεία αυτή βασίζεται σε μια αρχαία παράδοση που περιέγραψε την άφηξη στην Αθήνα του συγκεκριμένου ξόανου αφού προηγουμένως ο Διομήδης και ο, Θησέα, ο, Οδυσσέας, συγνώμη, ο, Διομήδης και ο Οδυσσέας το είχαν κλέψει από την Τρία. Στην ελόγω παράδοση ε, το στόλο, ο στόλος του Διομήδη και του Αγαμένωνα ή γενικά των Αργίων αγκυρεβολίε στο Φάλιρο κατά το ταξίδι επιστροφής τους στις πατρίδες τους. Αλλά οι Αθηναίοι δεν αναγνωρίζουν τους αφηθέντες, τους θεωρούν μάλιστα πειρατές. Έχουμε πολλές ιστορίες για πειρατές στα, στο Φάλιρο. Ήταν μια περιοχή που δέχτηκε, θεωρούμε, ε, επιθέσεις πειρατών. Οι Αθηναίοι μάλλον περδεύονται, τους επιτίθονται και εν τέλει αποκτούν το ξωάνο, είτε τυχαία. Ο Άκαμας, που ήταν ένας από τους γιους του Θησέα, το βρίσκει τυχαία στην παραλία. Από λάφυρο, γιατί ο Δημοφόντας, που ήταν ο άλλος γιος του Θησέα, αρπάσει το άγαλμα, όπως αναφέρει ο Κλιτόδημος. Σύμφωνα με την ερμηνεία του Μπούργκαρ, η πομπή της Παλάδος ξεκινούσε από το Παλάδιο, που δεν ξέρουμε ακριβώς που ήταν, ήταν ένα σημαντικό ιερό, μάλλον στα νότια-νοτιοανατολικά της Ακρόπολης, και μεταφερόταν. Οι γεννηταίοι ήταν μέλη του γένους των βουζυγών. Οι δύο ερμηνείες, σε κάθε περίπτωση, αυτό που ε, κάνουν είναι να συνδέουν ή που ονομαζόταν η άλαδε έλαση. Στις, 16 ή στις 17 Βοεδρομίου, δηλαδή στα τέλη Σεπτεμβρίου, αρχές Οκτωβρίου, κατά την δεύτερη ή την τρίτη μέρα των εορτών των μεγάλων ελευσίνιων μυστηρίων, οι μίστε συγκεντρώνονταν στην αγορά των Αθηναίων και κατευθύνονταν προς την παραλία. Η μέρα αυτή ονομαζόταν, μάλιστα, άλλα δε μίστε. Πιθλάς, του Άστεως, οι οποίες θεωρούμε ότι βρισκόταν επί της σημερινής οδού Φαλήρου, περίπου στο ύψος της διασταύρωσης της με την οδό Σπύρου Δόντα. Αφού έφτασαν δίπλα στη θάλασσα, οι μίστε λούσονταν για να εξανιστούν. Εν συνέχεια, οι μίστε επέστρεφαν στα σπίτια τους, προκειμένου να ετοιμαστούν για να μετάβουν τρεις μέρες μετά στην Ελευσίνα. Από επιγραφή που χρονολογείται στα τέλη του 3ου αιώνα π.Χ. ξέρουμε ότι οι επιμελητέ φρόντισαν για την άριστη διεξαγωγή της έλασης. Αυτό το καθήκον ήταν σίγουρα σημαντικό αν έχουμε υπόψη το μεγάλο αριθμό μισθών που κάθε χρόνο συμμετείχε στα ελευθύνια μυστήρια και συνεπώς στην άλαδη έλασης. Πράγματι, εικάσετε, για παράδειγμα, ότι το 408 π.Χ. περίπου 2.200 Έλληνε μοιήθηκαν στα ελευσίνια μυστήρια. Πρέπει να σκεφτείτε ότι ένα μεγάλο μέρος αυτών θα πήγαιναν στο Φάλιρο. Επίσης, πριν πάνε στην Ελευσίνα. Βέβαια, ο Σχήνης αναφέρει το θάνατο μισθών κατά την διεξαγωγή των μυστηρίων το 399 π.Χ. Ακόμα ο Πλούταρχος νημονεύει ότι ένας μύστης μπήκε στο νερά του Κανθάρου, δηλαδή στο Πειραιά, με ένα χειρίδιο στα χέρια του. Ο μύστης δέχτηκε επίθεση από κήτος, το οποίο κατάπιε το κάτω μέρος του σώματος του μύστη έως το ύψος της σκυλιάς. Ο σχολιαστής του Σχήνη, που φαίνεται ότι γνώρισε την ιστορία αυτή, διευκρινίσε ότι επρόκειται για επίθεση καρχαρία και την συνδέει με τη μαρτυρία του Εσχύ. Δεν ξέρω αν αυτοί οι κύριοι ξέρουν την ιστορία, αλλά τέλος πάντων θα έπρεπε. Με βάση τα λεγόμενα του, 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 του Πλούταρχου, οι ερευνητέ συμπεραίνουν ότι οι μίστε μετέφεραν μαζί του στη θάλασσα και ένα χειρίδιο, το οποίο έλουσαν. Δεν είναι σίγουρο αν στη συνέχεια οι μίστε θύσιασαν αυτά τα ζώα στην παραλία ή στα σπίτια τους λίγο αργότερα, αφού είχαν επιστρέψει από την ακτή ή πλέον στην Ελευσίνα κατά τις επόμενες μέρες. Πολλοί ερευνητές θεωρούν ότι η άλλα δε κατέληγε στο Φάλιρο, καθώς η ακτή του ήταν η κοντινότερη του άστεωστών και 
από την αμαρτυρία του Πλουταρχού μπορούμε να συναγούμε επίση ότι οι μίστε λούσονταν σε μια μεγάλη σέκταση παράκτια περιοχή που εκτινόταν από το Πειραιά έω και το Φάληρο. Σε σχέση με το συγκεκριμένο θέμα, πρέπει να επισημάνουμε ότι μια επιγραφή μαρτυρά την ύπαρξη Ελευσίνιου στο Φάληρο. Στο κείμενο αυτό, που χρονολογείται περίπου το 432 π.Χ., καθορίζεται ότι μια ομάδα λόγιστων έπρεπε να βρεθεί στο Ελευσίνιο του Φαλίρου για να υπολογίσει τις δαπάνες που είχαν προκύψει εκεί, εκείνη την περίοδο. Ήδη λογιστέ έπρεπε επίσης να μεταβούν και να ολοκληρώσουν αντίστοιχες διαδικασίες στο γερό της Δήμητρας, στην Ελευσίνα, καθώς και στο Ελευσίνιο εν άστη. Στην επιγραφή μνημονεύεται ακόμα μια ομάδα πέντε των τριών ιερών της Δήμητρας και της Κόρης. Ανάμεσα στις αρμοδιότητες των επιστατών συγκαταλέγοντα και η συλλογή του επαιτίου, δηλαδή του ετήσιου ποσού με το οποίο αυτά τα ιερά μπορούσαν να αντιμετωπίσουν τις δαπάνες της λειτουργίας τους. Το κείμενο της επιγραφής εκδόθηκε με εντολή της Αθηναϊκής Βουλής, οπότε μπορούμε να συνάγουμε ότι ο Δήμος Φαλήρου δεν είχε το έλεγχο ή ολόκληρο το έλεγχο της οικονομικής διαχείρισης του Ελευσίνιου του Φαλήρου. Δυστυχώς, τα κατάλοιπα του Φαλήρικού Ελευσίνιου δεν έχουν ακόμα εντοπιστεί και κατά συνέπεια δεν ξέρουμε πότε ιδρύθηκε ούτε πώς ήταν αυτό το ιερό. Σίγουρα διέθετε τα βασικά στοιχεία ενός λατρευτικού χώρου, δηλαδή ένα περίβολο και ένα βουμό, όπου προφανώς τελούνταν θυσίες προς τη μήν της Δήμητρας και της Κόρης και ενδεχομένω προς τη μήν άλλων θεοτήτων και ηρών, για παράδειγμα ο Τριπτόλημος. Στην σωζόμενη επιγραφή ορίσεται ότι ένα αντίγραφο της, της επιγραφή έπρεπε να στηθεί στο ελευσίνιο του Φαλήρου, Οπότε μπορούμε να εικάσουμε ότι εντό του περιβόλου του τεμένου υπήρχε ελεύθερο χώρο για την τοποθέτηση δημοσίων εγγράφων. Ένα στοικό κτίσμα θα μπορούσε να ήταν πολύ χρήσιμο στο ελευσίνιο του Φαλίρου, αν πράγματι οι μίστε κατά την, την έλαση του έρχονταν στο ελευσίνιο στι αρχέ Οκτωβρίου. Όπω ξέρετε, ελευσίνα, η λέξη ελευσίνα μπορεί να συνδυάσεται με την λέξη ελεύσης ως πέρασμα, ως διαδρομή. Λοιπόν, μπορούμε να εικάσουμε ότι στο γερό ανατέθηκαν παρόμοιε προσφορέ με εκείνε που μαρτυρούνται στο ελευσίνιο της αρχαίας αγοράς που έχει σκαφτεί από τους Αμερικάνους, από την Αμερικανική Σχολή. Εδώ. Για παράδειγμα, πυρήνα ειδόλια που παρίσταναν ανθρώπινε μορφέ με χειρίδια στα χέρια του. Ο Παστανία δεν αναφέρει κανένα λευσίνιο στο φάληρο, αλλά σε δύο χωρία του έργου του κάνει λόγο για την ύπαρξη γερού τη Δήμητρα σε αυτή την περιοχή. Ο Παστανία απήχει και μία παράδοση σύμφωνα με την οποία το συγκεκριμένο γερό ιδρύθηκε πριν από τους περσικούς πολέμους, ωστόσο πυρπολήθηκε από το στρατό του Ξέρση κατά την εσβολή του στην Αθήνα, στην Αττική. Έπειτα από την αναχώρηση των βαρβάρων, οι φαλληρείς συνέχισαν να χρησιμοποιούν το ιερό, αφήνοντας ορατά τα ίχνη της καταστροφής. Αφού το φάληρο διέθετε και αγροτική παραγωγή, όπως αναφέραμε με τα τάσφαλληρικά, τα λάχανα, δεν αποκλείεται οι κάτοικοι του Δήμου Φαλήρου να διεξήγαγαν στο γερό της Δήμητρας διάφορες τελετές, όπως θυσίες ζωών και εναποθέσεις άλλων προσφορών προς τη μήν της θεάς ως δωρήτρια της γονιμότητας και της εφορίας της ζύης πριν αλλά και μετά από τα μυδικά. Μεταξύ των ελόγων ιεορτών πιθανώς συγκατελέγονταν και τα θεσμοφόρια. Κατά τη διεξαγωγή αυτών των γεωρτών, τα θερμοφόρια, η θυσία χείρων από τις συζύγους των Αθηναίων πολιτών αποτελήσε η χαρακτηριστική τελετή, ενώ οι άντρες δεν συμμετείχαν ή είχαν ένα πολύ περιορισμένο ρόλο. Επίσης, παραμένει άγνωστο σε ποιο βαθμό μπορούσαν να παίρνουν μέρος οι άγαμες γυναίκες και οι δούλες. Ξέρουμε ότι οι γυναίκες των όμορων δήμων Αλιμούντος και Πειραιά εόρτασαν τα θεσμοφόρια σε γυρά της Δήμητρας που ονομάζονταν επίσης θεσμοφόρια και βρίσκονταν εντός των Δήμων τους. Συρλόγω για ένα ακόμα γερό, αυτή τη φορά της Ήρας, το οποίο βρισκόταν στο δρόμο που οδηγούσε από το Φάληρο στην Αθήνα. 
Και σε αυτή την περίπτωση ο Παυσανίας πληροφορήθηκε ότι ο χώρος λατρείας υπέστη καταστροφή από τους Πέρσες, αλλά συνέχισε να χρησιμοποιείται μετά την νίκη επί των Βαρβάρων. Ο ναός της Θεάς που υψωνόταν εντός του Ιερού παρέμεινε επίτηδες χωρίς στέγη και πόρτες έως και την εποχή του περιγητή. Φαίνεται ότι αυτά τα ξύλινα αρχιτεκτονικά μέλη του ναού δεν επι επισκευάστηκαν με σκοπό το γερό να αποτελεί ενθύμηση της μυρικής εισβολής. Στο ναό της Ήρας στήθηκε και άγαλμα, προφανώς της Θεάς, το οποίο, σύμφωνα πάντα με τους φαλληρείς, κατασκευάστηκε από τον Αλκαμίδη, ένα από τους σημαντικότερους κλίπτες του δευτέρου μισού του 5ου αιώνα π.Χ. Είναι μια ένδειξη της σημασίας αυτού του γερού να υπήρχε ένα τέτοιο άγαλμα. Ο Αλκαμίδη θεωρείται ότι μετά από τον Φιδία ήταν ένα από του πιο σημαντικού ε, κλήφτε τη Αθήνα. Αν η πληροφορία αυτή αληθεύει, τότε βρισκόμαστε ενώπιον μια έμεση ένδειξη τη σημασία του συγκεκριμένου γερού, το οποίο ούτω ή άλλω θα ήταν και ιδιαίτερα πολύ συχναστό κατά τα αρχαϊκά χρόνια, καθώ βρισκόταν όπω αναφέρουμε προαναφέραμε στην οδική αρτηρία που ένωνε το τότε κύριο λιμάνι της Αθήνας, το Φάληρο, με το Άστι. Δεν ξέρουμε αν η λατρεία της Θεάς απέτυξε και πολεμικό χαρακτήρα μετά την αναχώρηση των Περσών. Ωστόσο, μια απτή υπενθύμηση της μυδικής απειλής θα ήταν πολύ χρήσιμη, ειδικά κατά τον 5ο αιώνα π.Χ., όταν οι Αθηναίοι, προέβησαν σε τεράστιες δαπάνες προκειμένου να χτίσουν τα μακρά τείχη, καθώς και για να διατηρήσουν την συνοχή της πρώτης αθηναϊκής συμμαχίας. Έχουμε στο φάλιρο επίσης, έχει βρεθεί επιγραφή που χρονολογείται το 429, που αναφέρει τέμενο του Απόλλωνα Δηλίου, Υπάρχει μάλλον ένα ιερό στο φάλιρο προς τη μέρη αυτού του ε, Θεού. Αλλά δεν έχουμε περισσότερες ε, πληροφορίες. Σίγουρα ε, πρέπει να εξετάσουμε το ενδεχόμενο ότι αυτό το ιερό ε, ενδεχομένως ιδρύθηκε την εποχή του καθαρμού της Δήλου από τον Πισίστρατο ή ίσως μετά κατά την περίοδο της ίδρυσης της πρώτης Αθηναϊκής Συμμαχίας. Λοιπόν, ο Πασχανίας επίσης αναφέρει πάρα πολλούς άλλους ε, χώρους λατρείας σε ένα γερό στο Δία, προς τη του Δία, κάποια γερά προς τη μήν Ηρών, ήταν πάρα πολύ σημαντικοί οι ήρωες, ε, έχει μια σχέση πολύ, δυνα... πολύ έντονη το φάλιρο με τον Θησέα, με τον ήρωα. Ε, Θέλω απλά να σας πω ότι σίγουρα ένα από τα πιο σημαντικά γερά ήταν στο Φάληρο ήταν αυτό το γερό της Αθηνάς Σκυράδος, πολύ σημαντική. Ξέρουμε ότι κατά την αρχαιότητα ε, το γερό, η ίδρυση του αποδόθηκε σε ένα μάντι με το όνομα Σκύρος ή Σκύρον. Ε, δεν ξέρουμε ακριβώς την ετυμολογία. Ξέρουμε ότι η επίκληση σκύρας μάλλον συσχετίσεται με το ουσιαστικό σκύρο σε σκύρα, τα οποία δήλωναν μια ποικιλία λευκού ασβεστούχου χώματος ή γη λευκή. Και το φάλιρο, το όνομα φάλιρο, που επίσης μια ερμηνεία είναι ότι σημαίνει είτε φαλακρό, είτε λευκό, είτε κάτι που δεν έχει βλάστηση. Λοιπόν, εδώ σας δείχνω άλλες επιγραφές που μιλάνε για αυτό το ιερό. Ήταν, είχε σχέση με μία πομπή που ήταν η πομπή ε, των οσχοφορίων. Ε, ήταν μία πομπή που κατέληγε σε αυτό το ιερό και σε αυτή την πομπή ήταν ιδιαίτερη γιατί σημαντικά πρόσωπα στην επομπή ήταν οι οσχοφόροι, δύο νέοι, από συγγενείς οικογένειες που μεταφυσμένοι σε κορίτσια κρατούσαν όσχους ή αλλιώς όσχες. Οι όσχοι ήταν κλαδιά μπελιών με τζαμπιά σταφυλιών. Υπάρχει 
ε, υπάρχουν πολλές ερμηνείες για αυτή η πομπή, στην οποία αγόρια δίνονται σαν κορίτσια, υπάρχει τεράστια βιβλιογραφία για αυτό το θέμα. Λοιπόν, ε, δεν έχουμε πολύ χρόνο για να αναλύσουμε σε βάθος την πολύ πλευρή προσωπικότητα της Αθηνάς Εσκυράδος. Κλείνω λοιπόν την ομιλία μου τονίσοντας το μεγάλο αριθμό γυερών που ιδρύθηκαν στο Φάληρο. Συγκρίνεται με αυτά που υπήρχαν σε, στο Πειραιά. Ε, η, στην περιοχή λατρεύτηκε ο Δίας, δεν το είδαμε σε... Ε, το είδαμε πολύ γρήγορα σε αναφορά του Παρσανίας. Ε, ε, λατρεύτηκε ο, ε, ο Δίας, η Ήρα, η Δήμητρα, και η Κόρη, ο Απόλλωνας, η Αθηνά, καθώς και ε, πολλοί ήρωες. Υπάρχουν και άλλες θεότητες. Προφανώς λατρεύτηκε ο Ποσειδώνας, γιατί είμαστε δίπλα στην θάλασσα. Δεν έχουμε πολλές ενδείξεις γι' αυτό. Η Αφροδίτη, που επίσης έχει μια σχέση με την θάλασσα, πολύ έντονη επίσης. Ε, και όλοι αυτοί δέχτηκαν τιμές από τους αρχαίους ε, φαλήρεις. Όλες αυτές οι λατρείες αντικατοψήσουν τις ανησυχίες και τις ανάγκες των κατοίκων των αρχαίων δήμου, ε, του αρχαίου Δήμου Φαλήρου. Ας ελπίσουμε ότι τα γερά αυτά θα εντοπιστούν από την αρχαιολογική εσκαπάνη κατά τα επόμενα χρόνια. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Arjona, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And now we have a couple of minutes. If somebody has a question, uh, please. Λοιπόν, εγώ ήθελα να να μάθω σε προσωπικό σε Πώς, πόσο θα ήταν σημαντικό να υπάρχει την αρχαιολογική σχολή ε, της Ισπανίας στην Αθήνα. Ε, γιατί από ό,τι έχουμε δει εσείς είστε αρχαιολόγος που δουλεύετε σαν ελεύθερος επαγγελματίας. Ε, θέλω να μου πείτε την άποψή σας σαν ε, αρχαιολόγος και σαν Ισπανός. Ωραία. Ε, εγώ εργάζομαι εδώ στην Ελλάδα. Α, ναι. 20 χρόνια ως αρχαιολόγος. Ε, για να δουλεύω ως αρχαιολόγος έχω κάνει μια διαδρομή που σίγουρα θα ήταν πιο εύκολη αν θα υπήρχε ε, μια ισπανική σχολή αρχαιολογία ε, ε, εδώ. Ε, γιατί ε, βλέπουμε επίσης ότι οι σχολές, οι ξένες σχολές δίνουν ε, ας πούμε μια κάλυψη Ας πούμε, ε, τους ερευνητές. Ε, ακόμα και οι, ε, ε, οι πιο πρόσφατες σχολές αρχαιολογίας που ε, δουλεύουν εδώ, ακόμα και αν δεν είναι τόσο μεγάλη, μεγάλες όσο μπορούν να είναι οι μεγαλύτερες ή οι πιο παλιές, κάνουν μια φοβερή δουλειά. Δεν θέλω να πω μία-μία τις σχολές, Μπορώ να πω ότι έχω συνεργαστεί εγώ προσωπικά με την Ελβετική Σχολή Αρχαιολογίας, η οποία στην Ερέτρια και στην Αμάριθο κάνουν φοβερή δουλειά και βγάζουν στη συνεργασία με, το, με την Εφορία Αρχαιοτήτων ε, Εύβοιας και ε, έρχονται φοιτητές από την Ελβετία και μετά επιστρέφουν στις χώρες τους με μία εμπειρία, με γνώσεις που μακάρι θα είχαν, θα είχαν οι, οι, οι φοιτητές των Ισπανικών Πανεπιστήμιων. Είναι μία πολύ σημαντική... Ε, ε, είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό ένα ίδρυμα, ένα τέτοιο, κατά τη νόμη μου. Okay, and uh, yeah, sorry, maybe you can ask him later because we have a little delay now. Uh, but uh, in, in some time you can stay in touch. Uh, now we go to the next uh, conference. Uh, 
<laughs> Πολύ γρήγορα, καταλαβαίνω την πίεσή σα. Θέλω να συγχαρώ τον κύριο Αρχόνα, είμαι ο Δήμαρχο του Παλαιού Φαλήρου. Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω την Ισπανική Πρεσβεία αλλά και το Ινστιτούτο Θερβάντε που στεγάζει κάτι που για μα έχει πολύ ενδιαφέρον. Γιατί, όπω λέω στου νέου Έλληνε, ε, αν δεν μάθουν τον τόπο του, δεν θα τον αγαπήσουν. Γι' αυτό λοιπόν είναι σημαντικά αυτά τα στοιχεία που μα δίνουν. Θα μου επιτρέψετε λοιπόν σε αυτή τη μικρή διακοπή, αφού ευχαριστήσω, έχω φέρει κάτι να δώσω τόσο στον κύριο ε, Αρχόνα όσο και στην ε, Διευθύντρια του Ινστιτούτου, αλλά και στο μορφωτικό ακόλουθο που είναι εδώ. Αφού λοιπόν μας είπε τόσο σπουδαία πράγματα, έχω να τους δώσω λοιπόν, αν μου επιτρέπετε, στο λίγο αυτό χρόνο. Πού να το δώσω αυτό. Okay. Πολύ γρήγορα, δεν σας το χαλάω. Okay. Λοιπόν, έχω τρία λίγη. Το ένα θα το δώσω σε εσάς. Είναι η ιστορία της πόλης και του Δήμου, είναι και στα αγγλικά και στα ελληνικά. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Στην Διευθύντρια μας θα δώσω κάτι διαφορετικό. Εσείς σας έτσι δεν είναι. Είναι το παλαιό φάλιο λοιπόν από το 1900-1960 με πολλές φωτογραφίες. Γιατί το φάλιο έχει και πάρα πολλά άλλα στοιχεία. Εμείς στην Ισορία ξεκινάμε από τη μυθολογία μας, από την εποχή του Θησέα. Έχουμε στο Φάριο και ένα μηνόταυρο και τους ακροβάτες για να δείξουν το σημείο που φεύγαν και πηγαίναν να θυσιαστούν 7 νέοι και 7 νέες. Να υπάρχει λοιπόν εδώ στο αρχείο σας. Και ο προσωπικός ακόλουθος είναι εδώ. Επιπλέον ο κύριος Πρέσβης. Έχω και για εσάς το ίδιο βιβλίο. Να υπάρχει στην Πρεσβεία. Σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την πρόσκληση. Ε, βρήκα το χρόνο γιατί το βρίσκω πολύ σπουδαίο αυτό που κάνετε. Θα ήθελα φοιτητέ που ασχολούνται, Ισπανοί φοιτητέ που ασχολούνται με την αρχαιολογία και την ιστορία, με τα προγράμματα Εράσμου να έρχονται εδώ, να, να βλέπουν την ελληνική ιστορία. Άλλωστε και ο Ισπανικό λαό είναι ένα λαό ο οποίο ε, αναζητά την ιστορία και έχει προσφέρει πάρα πολλά στην παγκόσμια ιστορία. Σα ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την πρόσκληση. Χίλια συγγνώμη, ήταν πολύ χρήσιμο. Thank you so much. It was, it was unexpected, but a very good surprise, you know, and uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So, uh, well, thank you again for this uh, present uh, to the Institute and the Embassy. And uh, now we go to the next uh, presentation. We enter directly in the... Um, projects uh, related to uh, archaeology and especially to the projects related with uh, pottery studies. No? Uh, I have to say we have two presentations now in a row. Then after the second one will be the round for questions because each presentation is linked with the other. Then uh, I think is the best way to do. Once uh, Professor Saeth is finished, we go directly to Professor Fantucci. And when Fantucci, uh, Professor Fantucci is finished, then is the, the question uh, time. Uh, please, uh, Professor Saeed. Afternoon. Uh, moving to English again. Um, thanks a lot to the Spanish Embassy and to the Instituto Cervantes for bringing us back to Athens. It was, for me, two years since last visit, so it's great to be here again. Um, I must confess that my connection with classical Greece did not begin with youthful devotion or an intense and close link developed during the years of university lessons. Unfortunately, neither in secondary education nor during the years of my degree in history in Cadiz, I had the opportunity to study ancient Greek are truly specific courses aiming on the history of the Aegean. Actually, nothing beyond elementary notions that were always focused on the classical and Hellenistic periods and a sketchy introduction to the philosophy and arts of these periods. The training received during my years as an undergraduate a student and the very specific a specificity of the historical sequence of the, my corner of the Atlantic, uh, where I was raised, shaped my interest on the first millennium BC and especially on the Phoenicians, the colonial period of that end of the ancient Mediterranean, 
and the development of the area in the area of cities and large scale commercial and artisanal activities in later phases. Okay. In fact, I was lucky to be able to collaborate from the beginning of my career with the museums of the Bay of Cadiz and especially with that of San Fernando, an 18th century uh, city which was placed over the main artisanal hub of the Punic city of Cadiz. Uh, consequently, I was it was and still is very common to find Punic pottery workshops dating to the late archaic, classical, and Hellenistic periods. So from a very early stage, I was particularly interested in this line of research, which has been predominant among my activities and projects over the last two decades. In the most unanticipated and fortunate way, the study of Punic transport and foray of the manufacture and maritime distribution and of the historical implication of the trade of products packaged uh, inside them, especially of the famous salt of fish produced in the Bay of Cadiz, took me to the Aegean almost 10 uh, years ago now. Uh, since the 1970s, the discovery of Punic amphorae in places such as Athens, Olympia, and Corinth simulated the interest of Western researchers on these commercial connections. Since these items and products, unusual in the classical Greek world, allowed corroborating the descriptions of several ancient written sources on the existence of an intense and lucrative trade between Greeks and Western Punics, focused on the consumption of salted bluefin tuna of great quality and high price. Also, the Aegean finds, documented in stratigraphic sequences excavated and studied with more updated methodological approaches than those that were being applied at the time in the excavations carried out in the Phoenician sites of Cadiz, Malaga, and other key points in the uh, far western Mediterranean, stimulated also this interest. Since the publications of the first news about this Punic amphora found in Greece, these items and contexts became an almost mandatory reference, but also a distant object of desire for the colleagues who were work, then working on these historical issues in the early 80s. I was just a child at the time, of course. It was not until many, many years later that uh, our path would cross in the most unexpected way. Actually, it was simple, a matter of being in the right place and at the right time, and also being in the situation to add to the discussion of these materials the abundant information that we had been accumulating since the late 19th about the kiln sites and about the artisanal infra infrastructures that uh, where the famous Phoenix salted fish was made. In 2012, I met uh, Dr. Tatiana Fedropoulou, who was at the time a postdoc fellow at the Binner Lab at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. And as a specialist on fish remains, she was interested, among other things, in further studying the exceptional finds associated with Punic amphorae found in Greece, uh, like this, especially in, at Corinth. Hundreds of spines, bones, and dozens of uh, scale packs of salted tuna that was consumed at Corinth. Thanks to her and the support offered by Mr. Williams, director of, uh, director of the excavations of the Pinnacan for a building, and also Mrs. Uh, Bukudis, her first visit was arranged in the summer of 2014. Just a few days in which we were able to verify that the typological features of, and the fabrics found at Corinth fully match with the samples that I was able to bring from Cadiz and, and Malaga. It was a truly fairy tale moment for me, as I was able not uh, only to witness firsthand a moment long awaited by Western specialists on the topic, but also to get to know the modern town, the site, the impressive basement storerooms, the staff, and the excellent working atmosphere. I will never be able to thank enough the three of them for opening that door to me and for all their dedication and kindness during this first visit to Corinth, which I remember with great affection. 
Already at that moment, we realized that the study of Punic amphora found in the Punic amphora building had a remarkable scientific potential, and it was agreed to continue working on them in the following years, reviewing, re reviewing both the typology and the context and looking for the way to carry out archaeometric analysis that could confirm in a more robust way the volume of the imports that came from every single Western uh, Punic port city. The influence of this visit on me was incredible. Uh, so much so that since I had never visited uh, Greece before, I decided to extend the trip for several more days, visiting as much size uh, as I could in Athens, the, Pel the Pel Peloponnese, and everywhere I could before returning to Spain. That first visit in 2014 made me fall in love with the idea of working in the case of Korea, but also with the people and the country, and also the possibility of working in the area in the long term began to, to take shape, trying to connect both worlds, the classical Greece and the Phoenician and Punic world. Afterwards, another short study season was carried out at Korea, lasting only two weeks, which was decisive as I realized the potential of the site, but above all, I was able to get to know better the staff at the site who, was, uh, who always supported and made easier our work and worked to make me feel at home during these uh, first visits. From then on, the annual season to study the materials of the Punic Amphora building became a milestone every summer, and the Hispanic team traveling to Corinth grew as well. Visits of much longer duration were completed every year until 2019, supported by the American School, the University of Seville, and the San Fernando, San Fernando City Council. During these research stays, we bothered Julia, Panos, Nicole, Manolis, and almost everyone with uh, our interest to draw, photograph, describe, and sample almost every item and database uh, linked to the famous building and its surroundings. Visits to Marinos, also at the Hill House Terrace, or long afternoons at the, by the old Pietri storerooms, moving all wooden trays and drawing Punic amphora in the open air, were fundamental parts of those visits. And they have helped to strain ties with the site and its friendly staff, and in general with Corinth, which is not uh, today not only an object of scientific interest, interest for us, but a place as for the Punic 2,500 years ago, it's almost as familiar as our home in Cali. Since then, as it's frequently said, the rest is history. As the Punic Amphora Building Study Project grew, especially since the summer of 2016, uh, thanks to the Henry Robinson Corinth Research Fellowship, we spent two months at Corinth, and our interest focused not only in understanding this specific case, but the general dynamics of contact and presence of Eastern Phoenicians, um, Carthaginian, and Western Punic peoples and commodities across the Aegean through the first millennium BC. In this short time, in the case of Corinth, it evolved from research mainly concentrated on amphora to the certainty that it was necessary to study the whole context to understand the consumption patterns of this Punic amphora in that corner of the port city, and to clarify debates such as whether it was an early example of a tavern, shop, house, of a mixture of several of these uh, possibilities. Chronology was also an important issue, as to a large extent, the finds from Corinth, Olympia, and Athens had been used uh, since the early 80s to establish the chronology of these transport containers. And it was necessary to review whether these parameters were placed on a firm foundation. Therefore, since then, the idea of revising first-hand other data sets, which include similar Punic amphorae, such as those from Athens and Olympia, was taking shape. Also, we uh, thought that it could be helpful, helpful to understand the case of Corinth to carry on a broader and more systematic tracking of other Phoenician and Punic finds in order to better understand key questions such as the frequency and intensity of context, or if they were, in the case of imports from Cadiz and the Strait of Gibraltar, 
direct long-distance trade connections, or whether if Carthaginians, Sicilians, or other Italian Greeks or other communities could have played a significant role as intermediaries. Since 2016, we began to contact and to bother Greek colleagues and other international schools settled in uh, Greece in order to gradually collect information and to shape a first map of distribution of findings and a reference list, examining hands-on all those materials that had been possible so far. Consequently, just uh, before the beginning of the pandemic in early uh, 2020, we uh, submitted an application for a project to the BBVA Foundation specifically designed to move forward from these caves of the Punic Amphora building to a broader perspective. The project was granted in mid-pandemic uh, mid in, uh, in uh, a couple of years ago, and it was, has been in development since then. Despite the large-scale troubles caused by the virus and the many administrative difficulties we have had to, to face. Obviously, we have uh, limited access to collections, to sites, organization of conference uh, plan had to be canceled. Research is developing uh, at a slower speed than it was planned, but thanks to the team, which includes researchers from various uh, Spanish institutions and others based in Greece, we are starting to organize information uh, from numerous IGN sites and to review not only the typological uh, uh, typological and chronological attribution of many items or sets of items, but also the historical significance of their presence in the area. Therefore, the following summary of the goals, methodology, and the first achievements and outcomes of the project are the result of collaborations with many Spanish and Greek colleagues, as well as enthusiastic students and PhD uh, students of the University of Seville. So I must begin this second part of the lecture by thanking them for their patient support and their contributions to the project. Okay. Um, the project aims to approach what is known in previous historiography as the classical world from an alternative perspective, from the look of the others, paying attention to the context uh, and at the evidence left in the Aegean area and the Eastern Mediterranean by the interactions between uh, the Phoenician Punic uh, communities of the entire Mediterranean basis and the Greeks. In this regard, the project's approach aims to break with the traditional division between, between the two worlds described by long-established scientific literature as two ciliate uh, spheres in cultural and social terms, as two cir circles barely tangent in economic matters and antagonistic in many political and military, military situations, with a theoretical background that has largely been replicated and idealized visions transmitted by some classical literature. The project aims to demonstrate by examining all kinds of indicators that the connection established between Phoenicians, Punic, uh, and Greek groups in ancient times were much more complex and intense, establishing frequent in interactions in the cultural, economic, and social spheres with a fluid transfer of products, ideas, and people alternating, uh, alternating uh, clashes and alliances. This need to rethink the historical evolution of the ancient Mediterranean world and its peripheries, leaving behind the traditional views and giving greater weight to uh, archaeological indicators, has long been uh, the subject of attention uh, highlighted by numerous scholars. The project is thus part of this uh, fresh trend that in the last decades have been emphasizing the existence of an ancient world that is interconnected and interdependent in many aspects in certain way, globalized, and in which it is impossible to understand the development of certain patterns of socio-political organization, artistical, philosophical <coughs> uh, development, urban designs, key technologies, languages, cults, myths, and economic circuits without the in existence of a necessary connection between Greeks, Phoenicians, Carthaginians, Etruscans, Iberians, Italics, Egyptians, Cypriots, and many others. 
It is therefore an innovative uh, methodological perspective which tries to escape from the rigid modern conception of frontier concept, physical and cultural, and from the red lines drawn so far by historiography on classical culture, proposing a debate and an open analysis based on the examination of archaeological, literary, linguistic, and other historical documentation that has been undervalued or directly ignored by many escrows for decades. Specifically, the project aims to systematize information on the archaeological, epigraphic, and literary remains that provide information on the transfer of commodities or the settlement of Eastern Phoenicians and Punic in the Aegean through the first millennium BC. So the main goal is to produce a new overview with uh, solid scientific foundations on a scarcely explored but crucial aspect to understand the relations of the Greek world with the rest of the Mediterranean and the evolution of key features of their culture, economy, and language. This is the research will also focus on the individual or joint scientific study of this evidence and their publication, making it visible and putting it in a to historical context, which until now, it's been scattered set of material uh, of archaeological data that describe an intercultural uh, ancient Greek world. The main activity has been the systematis systematization of the data through the review of the academic literature, making the information accessible in a web-based database. This catalog uh, includes both published finds and also unpublished data from the various ongoing projects led by the team's researchers and others that may uh, be collected through the team members in, during work stays in the area. The dissemina dissemination of the findings and their interpretation will be carried out through websites that give access to the database and to an interactive map in which the findings are recorded and uh, will be placed along with detailed information, photographs, plans, and also short, short text. Here you can see a summary of the theoretical workflow designed for the project. The website, the interactive map, and its associated contents are the backbone of the activity and the dissemination of the results uh, being fueled by the data obtained both from the literature review and from the ongoing project, research studies, and collaborations developed by the members of the project, uh, or even the external, uh, some external researchers. Um, the design of the website and its combination in the interactive map with the database are key elements of the project probably representing its most significant contribution, that, uh, which can be extended and enriched uh, in the future in successive uh, phases of uh, re research to include other ge geographical areas and periods of the ancient Mediterranean. And pr at present, we are concentrating our efforts on creating the contents and developing some of these core aspects of the project, such as this, uh, the GIS viewer in the form of simple interactive map now, on which several dozen sites have been included, in which Phoenician and Punic materials dating back to the first millennium have been found. Also, the information related to each site uh, or item housed uh, in the website, giving access to it through an individualized file with the essential scientific content about its interest, relevance, interpretation, chronology, and references. These data sheets have been associated with the fine spot displayed in the interactive map in the, for, uh, in the form of short papers that can be read in open access. Website also will host the three-dimensional photogrammetic models of items developed by the team, focusing first on the items studied at Corinth. We're also working to include a small virtual library and the contributions resulting from the project will also be hosted in the, in the web. We have been able to develop a simple website which has its core, as I said, in the database and the open format visualization of this data through the inter interactive map. 
And also uh, the short downloadable down papers. All the information available in the uh, bibliographic sources have been taken into account for the elaboration of the data sheets, uh, including context of the finding and general information of the sites to make them as complete as possible. We have also generated our own plans and illustrations, usually based on the published data, data uh, until we have the chance to examine the materials firsthand. On the one hand, uh, the data sheets have addressed the study of the Phoenician Punic epigra uh, epigraphy identified in the IGN area, which includes several bilingual finds, and on the relationships with established uh, in the linguistic sphere between Phoenicians and Greeks from the early first millennium BC, which are key to understanding the formation of Greek language itself. In this slide, you can see a well-known funerary still uh, found in Athens, bilingual, dated in the late 4th or 3rd century BC. On the other hand, the data sheets deal with the finding of Punic and other Western coins in the area, such as an example of a Punic, a Punic bronze from Sicily, dating to the end of the 4th century BC, found in the Building 3, excavated at Corinth in the Southwest Forum area. Also, you can see another coin here uh, found on the west path of the Fountain House in the Agora of Athens. It is a silver denarius minted by Yuba I, king of Numidia in North Africa, and which includes a Latin and also Neoponic inscription. This coin can be dated in the second half of the first century BC. Also, Punic amphorae found in the Athenian Agora have been included in the database. These, these were studied a few years ago in collaboration with Professor Mark Laba, uh, with permission of the American School of Classical Studies. Here you can see some uh, T11213 amphora dated in the mid 5th century BC, which were produced in the coast of Malaga and Cadiz and that are similar to those found at Olympia and Corinth. Imports from the Western Mediterranean are minority in the Agora, but a large number of Carthaginian amphorae have been found, dating to the late classical and the Hellenistic periods, including many stamps on vessels coming from mostly from northern Tunisia and western Sicily. As mentioned earlier, in 2014, part of the team started a project focused on the Punic Amphora building found at Corinth, resuming the study of one of these, uh, uh, of these emblematic contexts related to the uh, relations between the Western Punic and the uh, Greeks uh, in the classical period. The building, located next to the Agora and the main archaic sanctuaries, has allowed us to reevaluate the commercial context established with the Western uh, salted fish and pottery production areas. Leandro Fantuzzi will discuss the amphora, the archimetric analysis, and the significance of the results at length afterwards, so I will not stop uh, on this. Just say, uh, yeah, I have to say that just uh, a number of data sheets are in production for this context, including several hundred transport amphora from Cadiz, Malaga, and Belet Malaga, but also from Carthaginian cities in the central Mediterranean, especially those from uh, Western Sicily and Northern Tunisia, and more rarely Malta. Another case study considered in our database and briefly report in short notes uh, is the wreck found uh, off the island of Levita. Surveys carried out by uh, Professor George Kosoflakis and the team of the Hellenic Ephorite of Underwater Antiquities identified a wreck that was loaded with hundreds of Levantine amphorae, but also with some Carthaginian vessels, Rhodian and Greco-Italic amphorae, the later problem from, from Sicily. The fabric of the Levantine amphorae suggests that they might have been produced on the southern coast of the Levant, possibly in the area of Tyre, and might have been related with the trade of wine. The very homogeneous set of materials found in the Greek so far allows establishing a date of the shipwreck uh, around 
the second quarter of the third century BC, finding many similarities with the Koroni camp in Attica, for example. This is an exceptional discovery since it's the first time that a Greek is found in the Aegea whose main cargo consisted of Phoenician amphora, and also because of the presence of Carthaginian transport containers, providing the first clear evidence of the routes followed by these commodities to reach the Aegean. Another case that has been included in the entries associated with the web map is that of the Punic amphora found in the excavations carried out by the German Archaeological Institute in the sanctuary of Olympia. These items are very similar to those found in Athens and Corinth, coming from Cadiz and Malaga, and dating back to the 5th century BC. Horacio González, by kind permission of the German Archaeological Institute, has been able to make the first review of this material, which is uh, even better even better preserved than the, the one that we have studied at Corinth and, and Athens, since, as you can see in the slide, right, right there, uh, several examples preserve the Pinti in red, still clearly readable. The database and the publication of short papers is open to all interested researchers, not only to the project team. After formatting, the data sheets will be uh, available on the web in open access and we'll have a DOI uh, document object identifier provided by the publishing house of the University of Seville. So they will be like journal articles in terms of academic curriculum. The guidelines and examples of data sheets, so short papers, are uh, already available on the website in English. So if you find and identify some Phoenician or Punic amphorae or other items in your projects, we will be very happy to receive your contributions. I'm um, gonna move forward. We've been working also in uh, public outreach and dissemination of the results, collaborating with uh, other projects, such as this, you can see, Planet Tuna. We have been having some fun with the, with the kids, with primary schools, secondary schools also, playing with them with the uh, amphorae, how to make an amphorae, how to salt <laughs> the fish and things like that, and you know, showing them the, the connections between the, the two worlds and the two sides of the Mediterranean. So, going to conclusions, um, certainly something that the project has shown is that there are many more artifacts of Phoenician and Punic provenance in the Aegean that we initially presume, and that the historical references provided by other sources, literature, inscriptions, coins, uh, found both in the Aegean itself and outside uh, the area, is an instrumental uh, is in trying to explain the scattered and offer unconnected pieces of the puzzle. Um, I think I will stop here and say thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Saeed, for this interesting presentation. I never saw those amphora. <laughs> now is the turn of uh, Professor Fantucci, and after the presentation of Professor Fantucci, we will start uh, with the questions uh, to both uh, papers. Uh, well, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization of this uh, conference to the Spanish Embassy and the Instituto of Cervantes for making this event possible, so thank you very much. And thanks everybody for coming here. Um, the idea of this um, talk is to show you um, a project that we have been working in the last years, um, as Dr. Saez has uh, been commenting on, um, that is focused on the uh, study of economic interactions or connections uh, between the ancient Greek city of Corinth and um, the Punic cities in the Western Mediterranean. Um, based 
precisely on the uh, information obtained from the scientific analysis of uh, archaeological ceramics. Um, oh, oh, okay. So, um, as um, Dr. Saez has um, been commenting, uh, this is a research that was born uh, a few years ago uh, as part of a wider project uh, entitled Core in Punic for a Building Project. Um, this is a large project uh, aimed at reinvestigating the, uh, con the context of the so-called Punic for a Building in Corinth. Uh, and it is a project that, ha that has been uh, carried out jointly between various institutions, the University of Sevilla, the American School of, the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, uh, and the British School at Athens, among others. Um, this project included especially the uh, re-study of materials found in the archaeological excavations conducted in the 1970s uh, at the Punic for a Building in Corinth, uh, and in particular the reanalysis of the ceramic materials, the fish remains, and all the material context, uh, and also 3D digital reconstructions of the building, uh, experimental studies, and other activities have been uh, performed as part of this uh, wide project uh, as, have, as you have um, seen in the previous presentation by uh, Dr. Saez. Now, one main part of this large uh, research initiative consisted in performing a scientific study of all these Punic amphoras found in this building in Corinth in order to better understand the connections that existed between uh, East and West in the classical period, as I will uh, show you in this presentation. Um, this is a research that I undertook uh, working at the Fish Laboratory of the British School of Athens. Uh, thanks to the support of Mr. Charles K. Williams II, uh, Director Emeritus of the uh, Corinth Excavations of the American School of Classical Studies, uh, and which was possible also thanks to the uh, collaboration of many researchers and institutions, uh, but especially of uh, Evangelia Kiriatsi and all the staff from the Fish Laboratory of the British School of Athens and Antonio Saez from the University of Sevilla. So, um, first to contextualize this project, we need to go back to the uh, excavations conducted between 1977 and 1979 at the Forum of Corinth by the American School of Classical Studies at Athens and directed by uh, Charles Williams. Uh, during these excavations, a building from the mid-5th century BC was uncovered, and in this building, uh, thousands of amphora fragments and other ceramics were found. Uh, most of the ceramics have, have been uh, crushed and reused as building materials for uh, the floors of the building. So based on the study of uh, all the amphoras, the fine wares, and other ceramics uh, found in this building, it was possible to interpret uh, this building most likely as a tavern where the uh, local elites could have consumed uh, luxury wines from the Aegean and the famous salted fish from the Punic West, uh, which is mentioned in Greek literary sources of the classical period. Uh, precisely the most remarkable finding in this building was a surprisingly large number of Punic amphoras and associated fish remains. Um, the vast majority of the amphoras found in this building uh, had a similar shape which was typical from the Strait of Gibraltar uh, in the Western Mediterranean, while a minor amount of the Punic amphoras uh, were more typical from the Central Mediterranean uh, according to the shape of these containers. So the amphoras from the Strait of Gibraltar uh, were in direct association with fish remains, especially with uh, rectangular fillets or scale packs of tuna. Um, so this was indicating that these containers, or these amphoras were used as containers for uh, transporting chunks of dry salted fish uh, from the Western Punic sites to Corinth. So this is a unique assemblage of uh, Punic amphoras that it is still to this day um, one of the most significant archaeological assemblages to uh, understand the commercial links that existed between uh, East and West in the classical period. Um, now, how was this trade uh, of fish products between uh, Corinth and the Punic West? 
Um, in the early 1980s, a first scientific analysis um, carried out by Yanis Maniatis and collaborators suggested that all the Punic amphoras uh, found in the Punic amphora building in Corinth would come from one single or neighboring production site in the Strait of Gibraltar, either southern Spain or northern Morocco. And based on this first study, uh, also in the 1980s, uh, Zimmerman Moon proposed a model to explain the organization of this uh, saltfish trade between uh, the Punic West and uh, classical Corinth. Um, the available archaeological and historical evidence uh, suggested that Cadiz, the Punic Gadir, uh, had a main role in this trade, but at that time the only known uh, production site of Punic amphoras in the region was in Kuas, in Morocco. So based on this evidence, this first model proposed by uh, Zimmerman was that the amphoras were produced at Kuas in Morocco and then transported empty to Cadiz where they were packed with fish and uh, shipped eastwards to uh, Greece. Um, however, over the last decades, um, the amount of evidence for Phoenician puny come for a production sites in the Western Mediterranean uh, has experienced a significant increase. Um, and specifically for the classical period, uh, we, have, we have now clear evidence for uh, amphora production in different areas, uh, especially in the Bay of Cadiz and the coast of uh, Malaga province in Spain, in addition to Quas in Morocco. Um, in other areas, such as the Bay of Algeciras, the coast of Granada and Almeria, or other parts of the Moroccan coast, um, there were very important Punic settlements, and it is supposed that a production of amphora could have taken place, uh, but there is no direct evidence so far for this period. Um, now, based, or, um, based on these recent advances in the study of uh, Punic amphora production sites, uh, a few years ago, we proposed uh, with Dr. Saez to uh, re-examine the um, Corinth Punic Amphora building uh, context as part of this um, wide project that I mentioned at the beginning. One of the main objectives of uh, re-studying this context from uh, the Punic Amphora building was to analyze the Punic Amphoras in the light of the new evidence in order to answer some of the main questions related to this context, uh, particularly where were these uh, Western Punic amphoras produced? And related to this, which Punic city or cities were involved in this trade of uh, salt fish with Corinth and other Greek cities? Uh, for the typology of the amphoras, it was already known that they should come from the Strait of Gibraltar area, either southern Spain or northern Morocco. But the question was, did they come from one site, as was initially suggested, or from many sites, and from which sites? Um, in fact, the first macroscopic re-examination of all these amphoras uh, indicated that uh, various Punic uh, cities in the West may have been involved in this trade uh, of uh, salt fish with Corinth in the 5th century BC. So testing this hypothesis uh, became the starting point of a new research program uh, following a methodological approach based on ceramic archaeometry uh, this approach involves the uh, scientific analysis of ceramics uh, through instrumental laboratory techniques, including uh, especially techniques for the petrographic and the chemical or elemental uh, anal analysis of the materials. This approach, um, or the characterization of the amphoras through this approach, uh, enables us to gain information on their provenance, their production technology, and other aspects and all this information can serve as a basis for investigating wider archaeological problems, uh, like, for example, in the case of these transport amphoras, the study of economic aspects linked to their uh, production and trade. Um, so for this research, we uh, planned a provenance study of the Punic amphoras found in this building, in uh, the Punic amphora building in Corinth. And for this purpose, we um, performed the petrographic and elemental analysis of more than uh, 170 of the Punic amphoras found in this building in uh, Corinth. Um, but this project included not only the analysis of the amphoras found in Corinth, but also the 
comparison with uh, new and published data from uh, production sites in Spain and Morocco. Uh, and for this reason, uh, we carried out also an extensive sampling and analysis of more than 100, and punic, uh, 100 of Punic uh, amphora samples from various production sites in these areas that could be used as reference material for uh, comparison. Uh, most of these reference samples that we analyzed uh, come from uh, production sites or from kiln sites with clear evidence uh, for uh, amphora production in the Punic period, uh, especially samples from the workshops in San Fernando in the Bay of Cadiz, uh, from Malaga City, from Cerro del Villar, uh, and also from the site of Los Algarrobeños in Vélez, Málaga, uh, as well as from Cuas in Morocco. Uh, in addition, in order to explore other potential production areas, uh, we have analyzed also samples from sites with a possible production uh, of amphoras in the Punic period, but with no direct evidence so far. So this included the analysis of amphoras from sites like uh, Kitan and Tamuda in Morocco, uh, from Melilla, and also from Baria in Almeria. Um, and in addition, uh, to these amphora samples from Corinth and from uh, Spanish and Moroccan sites, uh, we have analyzed also samples of potential raw materials for ceramic production uh, collected from the areas surrounding the likely production zones. Uh, this includes so far the analysis of more than uh, 25 samples of clays and sands uh, collected in the areas of San Fernando in the Bay of Cadiz uh, the mouth of the rivers Guadalhorce and Guadalmedina in Málaga, or the mouth of the rivers Vélez and Algarrobo in Vélez, Málaga. Um, so the scientific investigation of all these materials was carried out through a specific uh, research program that uh, was undertaken at the Fitch, at the Fitch Laboratory uh, of the British School of Athens. And this involved the uh, petrographic investigation of the amphoras uh, by means of uh, thin section optical microscopy, um, the elemental analysis of the amphoras through uh, X-ray fluorescence, uh, and also the experimental refiring of ceramic samples. Uh, and as for the samples of potential raw materials of clays and sands, uh, experimental briquettes were made from each uh, clay sample and fired at, um, experimentally at different temperatures uh, for their subsequent um, petrographic and chemical investigation. Uh, and also geological samples of sands and rocks were in section for petrographic analysis as well. So um, the petrographic investigation of the amphoras has uh, provided us very significant uh, results. Through this analysis, we were able to identify uh, six main uh, petrographic groups uh, and also to determine their provenance, their origin. Uh, based on the comparison with reference samples from uh, pottery workshops in Spain and Morocco, we identified a main group, uh, group one, uh, related to a provenance in the workshops of, uh, uh, of San Fernando in the Bay of Cadiz. And uh, there were also other four groups, um, two to five, uh, coming from the Mediterranean coast of southern Spain. Uh, particularly um, from Málaga, in the case of groups two and three, and from uh, Vélez Málaga, in the case of uh, groups four and five, uh, especially group five, which is very well represented in Corinth, uh, but not as much as uh, the group from Cádiz, which is the best represented in the assemblage from uh, Corinth. And finally, we identified a smaller group, uh, number six, which is related to a few uh, amphoras coming from Western Sicily in the central Mediterranean. Uh, now, on the other hand, we uh, conducted the uh, elemental analysis of all these materials through uh, X-ray fluorescence, and the results of this analysis allowed us to identify a series of chemical groups and to observe a good correspondence between uh, these chemical groups and the petrographic groups that I uh, showed you before. So this uh, XRF analysis provided additional support to the uh, provenance uh, interpretation formulated on the basis of uh, the petrographic uh, study 
There is a provenance in the Bay of Cadiz for the main group one, a provenance in the area of Malaga for groups two and three, and a provenance in the area of Vélez Malaga for these groups uh, four and five. Now, when we integrated all these results with the macroscopic uh, re-examination of the almost 400 Punic Amphoras uh, found in the Punic Amphora building in Corinth, uh, we were able to uh, make some important uh, interpretations. The most, the most uh, significant observation that we can make here is that um, the group one associated with an origin in the Bay of Cadiz uh, is largely predominant in the assemblage of the Punic Amphora building, uh, representing about 68% of the Punic Amphoras found in this building in Corinth. Um, the groups two to five, which are associated with a provenance in the Mediterranean coast of Andalusia, and especially uh, in the area between Malaga and Vélez Malaga, uh, represent altogether about 28% uh, of the Punic amphoras found in this building in Corinth. Uh, and finally, the central Mediterranean amphoras uh, account for only about 4% of the Punic amphoras found in this building. Um, and they can be associated mainly with uh, imports from Western Sicily. So, uh, in summary, the um, results of this scientific investi investigation of the amphoras um, have provided evidence for uh, proposing a new model of uh, saltfish trade between Corinth and the Punic West in the 5th century BC. Um, we were able to observe that the Punic amphoras exported to Corinth were not produced in one single or neighboring sites, uh, as was initially suggested, but instead in several production sites in the wider region of the Straits of Gibraltar. Um, however, one of these sites, the Punic uh, Gadir in Cadiz, uh, had a dominant role in the production and export of these uh, amphoras, and uh, therefore this city had the control over this uh, saltfish trade uh, from the Punic West. Uh, the study also showed that despite the dominance of uh, Cadiz, uh, other Punic port cities like uh, Malacca uh, were also attempting to take part into this uh, saltfish trade with classical Corinth. And indeed, according to the results that we have been obtaining from this study, uh, we observed that uh, the amphoras from Malaga and Bels Malaga uh, are about one third of the uh, Punic amphoras found in the Punic Amphora building in Corinth. Um, it is important to mention also that apart from the archaeological evidence for uh, this saltfish trade uh, between the Punic West and Corinth, which is evident by the presence of the amphoras, um, there are also some Greek literary sources that mention these uh, fish products uh, from the Iberian Peninsula, from Sicily, and from uh, other areas. Um, these references are mostly from the classical period, and in some cases they talk about the uh, Tarijos Gadiricon, that is the dry salted fish from Gadir, from uh, Cadiz. So these references are very uh, interesting because they confirm the magnitude of these uh, trade links with the Punic West, and especially with Cadiz, uh, and they suggest that these uh, fish products from Gadir were famous not only in Corinth, but in general terms in uh, the, Greek, the Greek world of the uh, classical period. Uh, and in fact, in Greece, uh, apart from Corinth, um, for the moment there are some uh, few findings of this Punic amphoras in Athens and Olympia, but um, it is highly possible that other similar findings will be documented in the future. Uh, as Dr. Saez has been commenting, uh, definitely the re-study of the materials from old, from old excavations uh, will start to reveal the presence of these Punic amphoras in uh, various other archaeological sites uh, of classical Greece. So, um, in summary, the study of this uh, Punic amphora building in Corinth is um, extremely important uh, in more than one sense. Um, from the point of view of Corinth, um, it provides new evidence, on the one hand, on the consumption patterns of fish products in the classical period, uh, and on the other hand, it provides evidence 
uh, on the strong commercial links that existed with Cadiz and uh, other Punic cities of the Western Mediterranean in this period. Um, also, from the point of view of the Punic archaeology, uh, this context from Corinth uh, is very significant to better understand the uh, economic organization of the Western Punic sites in general, uh, especially in relation to the production and export of fish products, which was a key economic activity in the uh, Punic West, and also a flourishing business for the Western elites uh, from the 5th century BC uh, onwards. Um, and this context also gives us extremely valuable information about other industries related to the, um, to the fish industry, as is the case of the ceramic industry, of the pottery, wo the pottery workshops uh, that were producing the amphoras to commercialize this fish. Um, for instance, the um, analysis of the amphoras found in Corinth um, revealed that despite the broad similarities in their shape, uh, some types of Punic amphoras were coming from specific production sites in Spain. For example, one type, the T11216, was coming uh, only from Malaga, or the types T11214 and 5 were coming only from Vélez Malaga. Um, so all this information uh, obtained from Corinth is important because it sheds new light into the production areas of, this, of each of these uh, Western Punic amphoras, uh, which is an aspect that uh, has been poorly known so far. So this is an important contribution that the context from Corinth uh, also makes to the uh, knowledge of the amphoras from the Western Mediterranean. Um, now, after having obtained uh, these excellent results from uh, this project, um, our research is still ongoing um, because new questions and challenges have been arising from this study. Uh, we have now moved our attention from consumption size to the uh, Punic production areas in the Strait of Gibraltar. In order to further investigate and characterize the Punic pottery workshops in southern Spain, which is essential to better understand the uh, ceramics that are found in uh, consumption sites like Corinth. Um, in recent years, we have continued this research in the framework of uh, other new projects, uh, like the project uh, Grepure, already presented by uh, Antonio Saez um, and funded by the Fundación BBVA, uh, the project uh, Ergasteria, uh, also led by Dr. Saez and funded by the uh, Junta de Andalucía, uh, and also a recent project uh, focused on the areas of uh, Malaga and Melilla, led by Dr. Mora Serrano from the University of Malaga and funded by the uh, Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation. Um, in all these um, projects, we continue our collaboration with uh, various institutions, uh, including, among others, the uh, British Kuladatons for the scientific analysis of the ceramics. And among the various aspects that uh, we have been continuing investigating, uh, there is the issue of the relations between uh, the Punic and the Greek wars uh, that go beyond the trade of material goods and involve other uh, types of cultural exchanges. Uh, from the point of view of the ceramic analysis, uh, we can observe these kinds of, these kinds of uh, cultural influences uh, for example, in the existence of imitations of uh, Greek amphora forms in the Phoenician or Punic uh, production sites in the Western Mediterranean. Um, for instance, uh, some rare examples of these imitations are known in the area of Cadiz. Uh, in this case, it is interesting to remark that during the uh, 5th century BC, uh, the workshops that were located in the Bay of Cadiz uh, were producing the typical Punic style amphoras that I showed you before, uh, and also very few quantities of amphoras imitating Greek types, uh, such as the so called Ionian type or uh, Corinthian A imitations, for example. Um, and we have found uh, the same phenomenon in the case of Malaga. Uh, very recent excavations at the kiln site of Martiricos in Malaga City. Uh, uncovered apart from Punic style amphoras, 
uh, a few examples of Ionian type amphoras that uh, resulted to be uh, local imitations produced in Malaga, uh, based on the analysis that we have been uh, conducting on these materials. Uh, in the same site, um, various different Greek, Greek amphoras imported from Corinth and possibly from Corfu and Samos uh, were also found, uh, which is indicative also of these exchanges between East and West in, the, uh, in this period. So um, to finish the uh, analysis of archaeological ceramics, uh, especially through the application of scientific analytical techniques, uh, can, can provide us uh, with a unique type of evidence to better understanding uh, different types of interactions between uh, the Greek world and the Punic Western Mediterranean. Um, a series of uh, research projects uh, carried out in interinstitutional collaboration between Spanish and Greek institutions uh, has given us the opportunity to uh, gain new insights into these issues. Um, the recent advances from the Corinth Punic Amphora Building Project uh, include new evidence on the commercial links that existed uh, between the Western Punic sites and Corinth in the classical period, uh, and also on the organization of this uh, long distance trade of salt fish uh, from the Punic West to Greece. Uh, including here the role played by Punic cities like uh, Gadir or Malaka in these commercial interactions. Uh, and also the role played by Corinth uh, as a main commercial gateway to Athens and the Aegean in general for these uh, fish products. Um, these recent projects have also provided uh, us with new evidence on ceramic production at various Western Punic uh, sites. Uh, among other aspects, the identification of imitations of Greek forms in some of the amphoras produced in these Western sites uh, is an interesting phenomenon um, that should be contextualized in the framework of the cultural influences between the Greek world and the Punic uh, cities in antiquity. So these are lines of research that we plan to continue developing in the next years uh, in order to shed more light uh, into these connections between the uh, Eastern and the Western Mediterranean in the uh, classical world. And uh, I just want to finish here by uh, thanking uh, the many institutions and people who, ca who have been uh, supporting these uh, research projects uh, and making all this work possible. So uh, I express my gratitude to these institutions and people. And uh, well, I finish here and thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Fantucci, for this wonderful presentation. Now we have uh, the questions. I think is uh, both presentations is uh, a very good example of an interconnected Mediterranean already for the fifth century BC, if not previously. And uh, well, we have uh, two, three minutes for questions. After that, we have to go to lunch. But uh, please go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to know, if, is there any evidence at all that these uh, amphora held anything else besides fish? Is, uh, e either in Greece or locally, just uh, out of curiosity, did they use uh, these shapes for any other goods? Uh, you mean about the um, other, co other content apart from fish? Or? Yeah, were the amphoras used to transport other uh, goods? Well, Do we know at all? Yeah, in particular, these amphoras are related uh, exclusively with fish products, as far as, uh, as we know. Okay. Uh, the, we know this not only, not, not only from the current context, but of course from the production size in Spain, because um, in Spain there are uh, huge quantities of fish processing facilities related to this. So it's uh, pretty much a one-to-one -one correlation. If you find an amphora, then it's for fish. Uh, yes, yes. More yes, or yes, less. Yes. Okay. There was one question more here in this uh, part of the hall. Very, very short question. Uh, well, congratulations for the systematic research you have been conducting. And uh, just one small question. What about the role played by Syracuse in the middle of the way? Because it's a long way from, and you didn't mention any amphoras or excavations there, just out of curiosity. 
Yes, uh, yes, I haven't mentioned this in the talk, uh, but uh, of course there is also the, no, no, I haven't mentioned it because I, I didn't uh, just for time, but uh, of course uh, there is the importance of uh, Sicily here uh, because even if we have only very few amphoras, this means that there was a port of call at, um, at Sicily at some point. And here we still don't, do not know exactly the uh, type of relation between Cadiz and, Co and Corinth uh, in the sense that uh, we, do not, we do not know if it was a direct relation uh, or there was, for example, a transshipping center in Sicily or in some of, in the Pyrrhic Sicily or maybe some Greek uh, port in Magna Grecia or the Greek part of Sicily that was, um, digamos, uh, sorry, that was a transshipping center in this area. So these are aspects that uh, we do not have more evidence for the moment to, mm, to know with precision, but maybe uh, in the future we find uh, more evidence about this. This amphora has been uh, found not only in uh, TAG, but also from the, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from Metruria to Sicily, to the Greek part of Sicily, we have a lot of fine spots of this amphora and fish products, so they, they were consuming as well the fish products. So maybe some of these ports could have played a role as intermediaries with, with the East, but it's really hard to tell without any uh, literary reference, explicit literary reference. We have for the Roman period for sure the role played by Puteoli and later Ostia in this trade that continues. Yeah. But for this but, early but moment, that uh, is part of the same uh, economic system exactly. and political this system. Is, exactly. <laughs> but th this is a you know a scattered political Mediterranean. Yeah. Maybe in the future you have to do a project <laughs> in Italy as well, no? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the thing is that uh, the Punic Amphora building is abandoned at the end of the fifth century, and all we find in the city, it's Corinth, but also in Athens and other places. Since then, are no more uh, Western Punic imports, but all, only from Sicily and also Tunisia, and, yeah. and uh, it, it, it's the same uh, period in which uh, salt fish factories are established, both in the Punic side of Sicily, but also in the Greek side, especially around Syracuse. So. Yeah, maybe after the crisis of the late 5th century, they have a more um, prominent role in this trade. Okay, thank you so much. There is no more time for questions now because we have the lunch time. And uh, yeah, we will be at 3 o'clock again here, maybe five minutes later, but please be on time. <laughs> thank you. Uh.